chapter three, and we'll get into that. First thing I want to discuss, though, is uh, we have just talked about how Christ cleared the marketplace that had been set up in the court of the Gentiles. Let me give you a little perspective here. The court of the Gentiles was this huge area, walled area, with five, six entrances, eight entrances, and then the temple stood in the middle of that. The court of the Gentiles was about 13 acres of property. <clears throat> and what it had become is like what Christmas is today, a marketplace. Here's what they did. It was a bazaar with vendors selling souvenirs, sacrificial animals, food, as well as currency, exchanging Roman for Tyrian money because the Jews were not allowed to coin their own money and they viewed Roman money as an abomination, which is interesting. If you've ever seen a Tyrian shekel, it has pagan symbols on it. But it wasn't so much that the shekel had pagan symbols, it was the weight of the shekel in silver that was constant. And so that was the only money allowed in the temple by the Pharisees. Guides provided tours of the premises. Jewish males had the unique opportunity to be shown inside the temple itself. The priests, the Kohanim, in their white linen robes and tubular hats were omnipresent, directing pilgrims and advising them what kind of sacrifices were to be performed. A short distance in, just before the 14 nine-inch steps that went up into the temple proper and the beautiful gate to the court of women, just before that <clears throat> was a ornamented, ornamented marble screen, four and a half inch feet high, and what it said in Latin and in Greek and in Hebrew. If you go beyond this, you would be killed if you were a Gentile. These screens, one of them has been discovered and excavated, and the wording on it is very clear. If you're a Gentile and you go beyond this point, you will be killed. Interesting, Christ clears this place on purpose, without anger. He does it by fashioning a whip, if you will, a cord, and driving the marketplace clean. And that, to me, is a miracle in and of itself. Because there were temple guards there, and the temple guards and Levitical priests would have stopped him. And the Roman legions that were adjacent to the temple would have uh, gotten wind of possible, if you will, uprising, and would have stopped it. But Christ, a Galilean, a Galilean upstart, if you will, who'd only performed one miracle and had very few disciples with him, drove those out of the market. And I mentioned Galilee because there were numerous cultural differences between the Pharisaic sect and those from Galilee. They considered them to be inferior, hicks, if you will, people who did not properly follow the rules and ordinances of the Pharisees. It is indeed a miracle that Christ got away with disrupting this market, especially at this time. This is Passover, and many theologians believe that he drove those people out of the marketplace at roughly the same time that the children in their homes were clearing the house of leaven, which represents sin. And so Christ, Psalm 69.9, zeal for his house consumes him, drove out the market and cleansed it so that his father could be worshiped. Verse 18, the Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of obviously was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. 
It wasn't necessarily a bad question, show me a sign. Anyone who drove merchants out of the temple courts claimed the authority to do so. The Jews wanted to know if Jesus really had this authority. The problem was, is they demanded the sign to prove it then rec without recognizing the sign that had already been shown them. The fact that they demanded the sign showed their arrogance and their hubris. And we always, always demand a sign. Their incredulity was due to the fact that Herod the Great had begun the renovation of the temple in 20 BC, and it was still going on to this day. 18,000 slaves or workers had been brought in over that time to work on the temple. It would not be completed. And in 70 AD, the Romans would come and destroy it. Here Jesus spoke of the temple as his body. The irony is that the religious leaders themselves would be the means by which the prophecy was fulfilled. When they said, destroy this temple, when Jesus said, destroy this temple, he knew that they would in fact do their best to destroy him. At the trial, one of the charges brought against him was, he said he would destroy this temple. When he died on the cross, the markers reminded him of his impossible promise. I love that Jesus confidently claimed the power to raise himself from the dead. And he repeated the claim in John 10, 18. And it's interesting to note that the New Testament also claims that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, Romans 6 and Galatians 1, and that the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead, Romans 1 and Romans 8. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was a magnificent Trinitarian work of our God. Verse 23. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Jesus knew that this was thin, if you will, superficial belief. It wasn't based on anything other than an admiration of the spectacular. Knowing this, Jesus did not commit himself to them. Marcus Dobbs, a theologian of note, a light or superficial faith may be better than none at all, but no one should think that it is enough. And Jesus knows. This is what Martin Luther called milk faith. And it may grow into something more trustworthy. Recall the time of your salvation. I can clearly do that. And I take a look at my life at that time and how the Lord, over the course of these years, since 1984, has changed my life. To be born again literally means that my spirit was rejuvenated, regenerated, and that God the Father finally took over my life and guided it to a point where I am still wanting, I still need Jesus every moment. And I still get on my knees every day and right. beg forgiveness for the life that I'm living. But praise God, praise God, he guides us. He knew what was in man. Nothing less than divine knowledge is here set forth as the text now stands that it serves an entire knowledge of before we go to chapter 3, I find it very interesting, the juxtaposition of destroying the, world, the marketplace in the temple, and then a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, coming to Jesus. Because the Sanhedrin and the temple were linked. When the temple was destroyed, the Sanhedrin ceased to exist. The Sanhedrin was the most powerful body in Israel. And another thing of note, with the questioning by the Pharisee and the answers by Jesus, the Old Testament comes to an end and the New Testament is spelled out. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. 
Jesus answered him and said to him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The entire Reformation was based on Christ's answers right. to Nicodemus' question. He was one of the men who was impressed by Jesus' signs and a member of the ruling Sanhedrin. <clears throat> Supreme Council, tribunal, most exilic times. High priest, having religious, civil, and criminal jurisdiction. He was educated. Nicodemus is a Greek name. He was religious, pharisaical sect, influential, a ruler, and earnest. Although afraid he might be discovered, he still came to Jesus by night. He's a representative, if you will, of all men. And in a sense, he represented what is highest and best in man. This man came by night. His status caused him to be wary of this meeting. And he says, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. Now, it's difficult to know if Nicodemus spoke for himself, for the Sanhedrin, or for popular opinion. It's possible, however, that we know in Greek, oidomen, signifies no more than it is known. It is generally acknowledged and allowed that thou art a teacher come from God. What a statement from a Pharisee. Just that statement led him, I believe, to salvation. It appears that Nicodemus wanted an abstract theological discussion regarding Jesus' identity, but that was not what he needed. Jesus got to the heart of the matter. I love it when Christ is in a conversation with people like the Samaritan woman. It doesn't matter what they ask. He goes for the, the heart of the matter. He cuts to the chase. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus replied to Nicodemus, and it shattered the Jewish assumption that their racial identity, their old birth, assured them a place in the kingdom. He made it plain that man's first birth does not assure anything. Only being born again gives this assurance. There's no such thing as a good person, only a born again person. Right. It was taught widely among the Jews at the time that since they descended from Abraham, they were automatically assured of heaven. As a matter of fact, several rabbis at the time taught that Abraham stood watch at the gate of hell just to make sure that none of his descendants accidentally entered. Most Jews of the time looked for a Messiah to bring a new world in which Israel and the Jewish people would be preeminent, but Jesus came to bring a new life in which he would be preeminent. Our Lord replies, it's not learning, but life that is wanted for the Messiah's kingdom, and life must be, and must begin at birth. The ancient Greek word translated anew, anothen, can also be translated from above. To be born from above is to be born again. This isn't something we can do for ourselves. Jesus said, unless you are washed, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You might think, I can wash myself. A man might wash himself, but he can never give birth to himself. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Okay. Nicodemus' reply may not have been out of ignorance, but from thinking that Jesus meant a moral reformation. His question Maybe how can you teach an old dog new tricks? One way or another, Nicodemus clearly did not understand Jesus or the truth about the new birth. His description of the new birth, Jesus recalled a familiar theme from the Old Testament. I won't go into the 18 scriptures that come from Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. These passages essentially made three promises in the new covenant. The gathering of Israel, the cleansing and spiritual transformation of God's people, and the reign of Messiah over Israel and the whole world. In Jesus' day, the common teaching among the Jewish people was that the first two had occurred. They saw Israel gathered, at least in part, 
after the Babylonian exile, they saw strong spiritual movement like the pharisaical sect, which they believed fulfilled the promise of spiritual transformation. What they waited for was a Messiah who would elevate Israel as preeminent in the world and government. That's why Jesus' statement about the new birth was so strange to Nicodemus. He thought the Jewish people already had it. They certainly weren't looking for it. They only looked for a triumphal Messiah. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind, and the Greek word here is pneuma, which is spirit, blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. What he's saying is you won't see the spirit, but you will see the effect of the spirit in your life. I've never had a visitation by the audible voice of God. But boy, I've heard him clearly in my life, as you have. Jesus was emphatic in saying that man does not need reformation, but a radical conversion by the Spirit of God. We must be born of the water in the Spirit. Being born of the water, he uses a physical example. Born of water, the amniotic fluid that comes with the child. But he also uses a spiritual perspective. Born of water refers to a spiritual cleansing, and that Nicodemus would have naturally understood. According to this view, born of water and born of spirit are different ways of simply saying the same thing, unless you are washed and cleansed. So when Jesus told Nicodemus that he must be born of water, he was referring to his need for spiritual cleansing. Ezekiel 26, 25 says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities. Nicodemus, teacher of the law, which really have been familiar with the concept of physical water representing a spiritual purification. The New Testament uses water also as a figure of new birth. Regeneration is called washing, brought about by the Holy Spirit through the word of God at the moment of salvation, Titus 3, 5. Christians are washed sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Whichever perspective is correct, one thing is certain, born of water is not a reference to baptism. Baptism is nowhere mentioned in this context, nor did Jesus ever reply that we must do anything to inherit eternal life, but trust in him by faith, like a wonderful robber who died on his right side and who was with Christ in paradise. That which is born of the flesh, without the new birth of the spirit, the flesh taints all works. If the spirit is not born in essence, dead and flesh is all we can rely on. Before my salvation, I had a lot of people who followed me. After my salvation, many of them deserted me. And I realized what I was leading them to. Praise God, some of them. And at the witness of the lady I'm married to. And I pray for the others. Do not marvel what I said to you. You must be born again. Again, Nicodemus did marvel at this statement because like all Jews at the time, he believed he already had inner transformation promised in the new covenant. Jesus wanted to take hold of the fact that he does not have it and must be born anew. Verse 9. How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? Forgive me, but there are many, many people who profess to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, I want to pull aside and just ask them this. Are you a teacher of Israel? And do you not understand these things? 
Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earnestly things that you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Nicodemus was confused. He was so conditioned in his thinking that the new birth had already happened to him and all of faithful Israel that he had a hard time thinking differently. I'm sure you're all aware of the term paradigm. People who operate in a, under a paradigm hear best what they're supposed to hear and see best what they're supposed to see. And I'll relate a story to you that I'm never proud of, but it is instructive. When our son was, I believe, third grade, he failed. And he was set back. Dad, who happened to have been an academic overachiever, saw him as a failure. And because of that, I'm sure that's how he treated him. And because of that, I'm sure that's how he acted and continued to fail. Until I got input that I could not ignore. Input from my wife. And all she said was, he's not like you, Ed. He's no better, no worse, but different. His successes will never be yours. Yours yeah. must be his. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be going out into the woods with that young man this afternoon. I watched him raise two boys. And because of the input I got and the perspective I have and the paradigm I have about my son, I'm learning parenting from my own kid. Right. I changed my paradigm. And that's what Christ was trying to do with Nicodemus. He chided Nicodemus for not being aware of the need and the promise of the new birth because these were plainly laid out in the Old Testament. He knew the passages, but believed that they had been fulfilled. A simple look at earthly things like the illustrations Jesus has used should have made the point plain to Nicodemus and to us. If he could not see that he needed this spiritual transformation, what more could Jesus tell him? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven. The term son of man is Christ's favorite for himself. He will refer to himself using this title seven to several times in the Gospels. This is a phrase which all Jewish people would have recognized. It comes from Daniel 7, 13. It connects Jesus to the Old Testament. This is one of the places in John chapter three, where Jesus makes a claim to eat exclusivity. I am the son of man. In short, it means that Jesus is the one and only way to God. There are no other options. Verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Jesus made a remarkable statement explaining that the serpent of Numbers 21 was a picture of the Messiah and his work. <clears throat> a bronze serpent speaks of sin, but sin judged. In the same way Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us on the cross. And our sin was judged in him. It's a picture of sin judged and dealt with. As it says in Isaiah 45, 22, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, there is no other. We might be willing to do a hundred things to earn salvation, but God commands us only to look to him and trust him. Just to simply trust him. How often have we, have I, prayed, turned everything over to God, and then got up and took the four or five things back that I knew I could handle and that God might have been too busy for? Good night. Good night. I wonder how many times, I was thinking about this this morning, how many times has the Lord preserved my life, preserved our lives? First night in Berlin, first night that my wife was in West Berlin, Germany. 
December 1970. You're getting old. <laughs> we put the two kids to bed. We walk on the seventh floor balcony. I pour her a glass of Riesling, fine German wine. She puts it to her lips, and the East Germans shoot a guy off the wall right below us. And you go, oh my gosh, now I know why I'm here. I wonder how many times the Lord has protected us. One other example. With two kids, one a baby. Our kids are a year and a day apart. Kids, they're 50, 51 now. A year and a day apart. With a baby in her arm and a toddler by her side, my wife discovered a bomb in our washing machine. Placed there by the modern Meinhof gang trying to kill us. She had the presence of mind to turn and walk away. She saw the wire and called the authorities, the military police. What if one of our kids had been acting up and she opened the top? Who knows? Well, God has guided us right. simply because we trust him. Theologian F.F. F. Bruce Nicodemus had failed to grasp the teaching about the new birth when it was presented to him in terms drawn from Ezekiel's prophecy. Now, it is pre presented to him by means of an object lesson, a story with which he had been familiar since childhood. Well, I don't think we'll go much further today. I will quote the last verse of today's sermon. Because there's no more powerful way to deliver this message than to let John 3.16 speak for itself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Today, Glennis is about to lose her dad, but she knows where he's going. She's going to where his citizenship lies. And she is buoyed by that. We communicated yesterday. And she is comforted by the fact that although he will is alive in the spirit and will be with the Savior. Our takeaway is to pray for them. We pray that Jerry and Glennis and the whole family will be comforted at this time. And we know, we know that her father knows and will be in glory today. I want to leave you with this brief assignment, something to ponder. When a church obeys God, it flies in the face of culture. Yes. When we are obedient to the word of God, which we have just studied, we fly in the face of today's culture. Yes. But that's okay. Yes. Because that's what we're supposed to do. Yes. We're supposed to be a peculiar people. Yes. Unique and call. The Savior. Father God, we give you praise, Lord, and thanksgiving for the word that you have given us. We thank you, Father, for the gathering here today of people, Father, who trust you. Increase that trust, Father, so that we may be a peculiar people, that people will come to and say, what is it you have that I need? We give you praise, Lord, and thanksgiving for it's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Just briefly, as I said when we started, we would go into a short 